So for today's virtual mind walk, we have with us Heather Luwanig. Heather is an assistant professor of biology at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. She earned a BS in biology from the University of California, San Diego, and a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of California, Santa Cruz. She is interested in the physiological adaptations of animals in their environment and the evolutionary processes involved in those adaptations. Much of her research is focused on thermoregulation, the regulation of body temperature, and energetics, metabolic rates, in vertebrate animals, including seals, sea lions, and even lizards. She has been working with seals and sea lions for 18 years and recently launched the first formal research program to study the elephant seals at Piedras Blancas. Welcome, Heather, and thank you very much for coming today. Thank you, Robin. Thanks for that introduction. And thanks everyone for being here. I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. And I'm just super excited to share my love of pinnipeds with you guys and talk to you a little bit about what I'm doing here at Piedras Blancas with the elephant seals. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video so that I can see my whole screen when I talk to you about it. And I'll put it back on when we do the Q&A later. So this is going to be Elephant seal slanted, but I do want to start by talking about pinnipeds. Let me see if I can get this to go. So what the heck are seals to begin with? We'll get everyone on the same page with that. So seals are pinnipeds, which literally means fin footed from the Latin pinna for wing or fin and then ped for foot. And so the pinnipeds are, are all the different seals that we have. And there are three groups, and these three groups correspond to three families in terms of their evolution. So the phocids are the true seals, and the odoriads are what we call the eared seals, and those are our fur seals and sea lions, and I'll get more into that in a moment. And the third family is it, currently the only extant species is the walrus. And no, we don't have walruses on the central coast, but I wanted to orient everyone to who all of the pinnipeds are. And of course, walruses are distinctive because of their tusks and they live up in the Arctic, so in the north. So I'll focus in on the types of pinnipeds that we might see around here, which we're going to see true seals, our phocids, and also the eared seals, which are our odoriads. And that is how you pronounce that word with the two eyes in it. I had to ask when I first started studying seals how the heck do you pronounce that? And it is odoriads, which I guess makes more sense now that I look at it. So we're going to use this little elephant seal weanling as a representative of our true seals here for a moment. And I'm going to cover just some of the characteristics, some of which you can see when we see them out on land and some of which you won't necessarily see, but it helps to distinguish these different families. They do have distinguishing characteristics in their morphology, so how they look and also their behavior. So True seals don't have external ear flaps or pinnae. We have pinnae, that is the, uh, the little cartilage parts to, to your ear on the outside, but it doesn't mean that they don't have ears. They have the same kind of mammalian ear that we have on the inside of their heads. They just don't have the sort of outer bits that help to focus the sound into the ear. And it's thought that that's probably for hydrodynamic purposes. So it keeps them more streamlined if they don't have the little pieces sticking off of their head there. But their ears do work. They can hear on land and underwater. Another feature for true seals is that compared to the eared seals, they have shorter front flippers and they aren't really able to properly walk on their flippers. And I'm going to show you a video in a moment, although you may have seen how true seals walk. They can post up on those front flippers and of course those big elephant seals can raise themselves up off the ground quite a bit, but they aren't able to walk on all fours. True seals swim with their back flippers, and that's going to be in contrast to our eared seals. And I'll also show you a video of what that looks like. But the reason that they're not able to walk on all fours is they're not able to rotate their ankle bones so that their back flippers can come forward and they can post up on them. So when they move about on land, they're trailing their back flippers behind them. But then when they get in the water, that's what they use to propel themselves. So let's take a, let's take a look at what that looks like. And just for fun, we're going to see a couple males going at it here if you can hear them. So this movement on land that they do, the actual scientific term for it is called galumphing, which means moving awkwardly. <laughs> Although these guys are doing a pretty good job of going at each other, but you can see how they can't really use these back flippers at all. And it's all this inchworm movement and a little bit of posting up on their front flippers. And also for this female who's trying to get out of the way of these guys because they're doing their elephant seal thing. 
So that's galumphing, and that's how all of the true seals move around on land. So they've got to, in, in these in these big males, it's almost they're using their blubber and waves to get to get across the the sand there. But where they really shine is underwater. So this is not an elephant seal, but it is a true seal, and you can see that it's moving its back flippers side to side, right? So it's not like a cetacean. Cetaceans move their flukes up and down. True seals are gonna move their back flippers side to side. We'll see it in a moment, but you can also see this is a true seal with no ear flaps. And it's all about this side to side movement in the back. And they're actually able to get thrust in both parts of the cycle there because they'll tuck the flipper that they're not using to propel themselves and spread out the one that they are using to propel themselves as they move back and forth, which is pretty cool. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the eared seals, which are our fur seals and sea lions, the odoriads, and eared seals because they do have those little pinnae that stick out from the side of their heads that helps to bring some of the sound waves into their ears. And again, they have the same mammalian ears that we do on the inside. So the middle and inner ear are, are structured very similar, similarly to ours. Odoriads have longer front flippers and they swim with those front flippers. So the way that they swim is completely different from the way that you just saw in a true seal. And they're also able to post up on these flippers. But one of the things that makes them different from the true seals is that they are able to rotate those ankle bones forward. And so they can actually walk on all fours. And it still doesn't look super graceful, but it is faster and less energy expending for them to walk around on land than it is for a true seal. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like here. With a couple of animals that if you, if you notice the orange flipper tags, that means they got rehabbed at the Marine Mammal Center. And you can see how they can move much faster and they're able to walk around, walk on all fours. It is, it is sort of a waddling movement. They do have to sort of go back and forth with it, but they can get going quite fast and it doesn't cost them as much energy to move around on land as it usually does for a true seal because they're able to move a little more efficiently. Now the way they swim is kind of like they're flying through the water and they move their those big long front flippers in a figure eight pattern, which is the same way that hummingbirds move their wings. And it's very efficient because they get thrust on both the upward and the downward stroke of that figure eight. So they're not losing energy and flapping up and down. And you can see how amazingly maneuverable odoriads are underwater. They can just turn on a dime and it looks like they're flying through the water and that really shows how they can be efficient predators because they're able to chase the fish pretty well. So you're probably wondering, okay, fur seals and sea lions, right? They're all eared seals. Here's the pinnae on this one and the pinnae on the one I showed you before. So on the left-hand side here, we have an Antarctic fur seal. On the right-hand side, this is a picture of a California sea lion actually at San Nicolas Island in the Channel Islands. And the difference between these animals, so they're in the same family, but fur seals have a difference in their insulation compared to sea lions. So sea lions in terms of their insulation are actually more like true seals. They have, in terms of evolutionary time, switched to using blubber as their primary insulator. And as a result, they have short, coarse fur that isn't waterproof. And so really blubber is their primary insulator, especially when they're submerged. But fur seals have the ancestral state, which is really thick waterproof fur. It is similar to what we see in sea otters, although not quite the density that we see in sea otter fur, but they have very dense fur and it is waterproof. Their skin stays dry at the base of that fur. And that is their primary insulator in water. They do have some blubber, but it isn't as thick as we see in sea lions. So I'm gonna show you what this looks like and I wanted to just warn you, right? We're gonna go from cute whole animal pictures to showing you pieces of the insulation so you can get a feel for what I'm talking about under the skin. So still on the left-hand side, we have fur and blubber from an Antarctic fur seal. And on the right-hand side, we have the fur and blubber from a California sea lion. And both of these pelts are wet, but you can see here and here these little patches where at the base of the fur, the skin is still dry because the fur is so thick and those hairs intertwine with each other and prevent water from penetrating that pelt. 
And the blubber thickness, although this is pretty thick for a fur seal because it is an Antarctic fur seal and it's quite cold in Antarctica, it's not as thick as we see in sea lions. And that's because sea lions are really relying entirely on this blubber layer, this fat layer for their insulation when they're in water because their fur is not waterproof. Oops. I meant to say a couple things about that, but I clicked. So the fur is not waterproof. And so when they are in the water, the water does get all the way to their skin and the water will take heat out of their bodies. So they need to rely on that internal insulation instead. Okay, now we'll get back to cute pictures. So I'm just gonna go over a few of the most common pinniped species that we would see around here in the central coast. We do have a few more, most of which don't come on land. So we don't see them often, but occasionally in rehab centers like the Marine Mammal Center. But we're going to start with our quintessential California sea lion, Zolophus californianus. This is an adult female that I'm showing here. Again, you can see her ears, and this is sort of like this perfect sea lion position. And these are the only sea lions, in fact, the only pinnipeds that bark. So whenever you see those documentaries and they play the barking sound over any other pinniped, that is not okay <laughs> because it's only California sea lions that do the barking sound, which I'm going to play for you now. Right, so that we hear that in Morro Bay all the time with all the sea lions hauled out on the raft there. And that is your California sea lion, and they do bark. Stellar sea lions, which I'm not going to show you pictures of, they don't come all the way down here. They're most southern breeding areas on Unuevo Island, just north of Santa Cruz but they do not bark like that. So I've seen those documentaries where they talk about stellars and they play the barking sound in the background. It's like when they just play the standard hawk sound for any, any falcon, for example. It's not, it's not the same, but anyways. Uh, California sea lions have what we call sexual dimorphism, meaning that the males are larger than the females. So the males can get up to almost a thousand pounds and females hover below 300 pounds. And it's because the males, similar to what we see in elephant seals, defend territories and have harems. And so they're larger so that they're going to be able to fight over those females. California sea lion males are also distinct from other sea lion species because they have this morphological feature here called the sagittal crest. And it is a secondary sexual characteristic. So we only see it in males and we see it in the mature males. So when they're juveniles, you don't see that crest. And over time, it grows on their head. And that is unique to California sea lions. We don't see that in any other sea lion species. And it's actually a part of their skull that is growing. So this bump right here is the sagittal crest. And then you see it on their head like that as they get older. And so that is one of the distinguishing features of California sea lions and how you can tell a male from a female, at least in mature animals, even from far away. So another animal that lives off of our coast is the northern fur seal, Calorhinus ursinus. I love their name because Calorhinus means beautiful nose and ursinus means bear-like. And I'm not sure I agree with beautiful nose, maybe on the females, but <laughs> they are bear-like animals. And they breed mostly up in the Pribilofs in Alaska, but we do have a breeding colony of northern fur seals on San Miguel Island in the Channel Islands off of our coast. They are pelagic, meaning that they spend really almost nine months, sometimes more, out at sea in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So we don't really see them on land here except for breeding. And they don't breed on the coasts, they breed on the islands away from humans. But occasionally you might see one haul out briefly or they end up in rehab centers. And I wanted to mention them because they are still ours. We have animals breeding here in California and they sound very different. So I'm gonna play for you what Northern fur seals sound like. <laughs> more of a growling sound and if you hear that hissing in the background that's sort of a threat sound between the males that little <laughs> sound no one. all right <laughs> we're gonna stop that for a sec all right so these these animals, the males can get up to about 600 pounds and the females only about 110 pounds, right? So males are up to six times larger than the females. So we've got a large sexual dimorphism, meaning 
difference between the sexes, but the, they're not as big as our sea lions. In fact, fur seals are generally smaller in body size than sea lions are. Northern fur seals, though, have the thickest fur of any pinniped. So I mentioned, right, we're not quite at the level of a sea otter, but they do have a very thick coat, and they were hunted extensively back in the day for this fur coat because it is really lush and it is waterproof. And I just love also with northern fur seals, they have a ridiculously long flippers, both front and back flippers. And I think part of that has to do with their thick coat because their flippers don't have any fur on them and it allows them to dissipate heat across their flippers. In fact, when they get hot, you'll see these animals lifting their really big back flippers up and fanning them to try to cool off. So the harbor seal Foca vitulina is also known as the common seal because we do find it pretty much all around North America. And this is the quintessential harbor seal position on a rock, flippers daintily tucked. This one has a little piece of seaweed for extra effect. And these are true seals, right? So previously we had sea lions, fur seals, those were otoriads. This is a true seal like the elephant seal. And this is what they sound like. <coughs> more of a grunting noise. And these animals can weigh up to about 370 pounds. I didn't distinguish the sexes here because they don't have sexual dimorphism. And one of the reasons that they don't is because they breed in the water. So there really isn't an advantage for a male to be larger because they don't defend territories on land. So we see in the pinnipeds that have those land territories that they defend, we see these big differences between males and females. But in our water breeding pinnipeds, including the harbor seal, we tend to see the males and females being about the same size. And so, of course, we're going to talk about our wonderful northern elephant seals, Marunga and Gustarostris. And you already heard the males sounding off against each other as they fought. So I'm going to play you my favorite northern elephant seal sound, which is the mother's call to her pup, which I think is the sweetest sound that an elephant seal makes. Let's see if we can... <laughs> And that little ah, 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 at the end was the pup calling back to its mom. But I think that that is about the sweetest sound that we hear elephant seals make. The females do have a more guttural grunting noise that they make when, they're, when they feel threatened, like to the males who are coming too close to their pups or to each other when they're getting in each other's way. But their calls to their pups, I think, are really sweet sounding. So I wanted to briefly dive into a little bit of the history of northern elephant seals. We we, not me, but humans hunted them to near extinction in the late 1800s. And it's estimated that they got to less than a hundred animals total by the time that we stopped hunting them. And their, their last place that they were known to be during that time was Guadalupe Island in Mexico. And I had gone back and read some of these old papers and it kind of blew my mind. So you know, we, we thought that they were basically extinct and some folks went down to Guadalupe Island and found seven animals there. And in the paper, they said, we found seven animals and, and we figured that they were extinct. So we killed them and put them in the museum. Um, luckily, apparently there were uh, some animals that were not home that day and they managed to recover from that. Um, but, and also thankfully we, that is not our practice anymore when we think animals are about to be extinct is to just preserve them for posterity. We try to actually preserve them for the future. But because of our hunting activities, these are a literal textbook example of what we call a genetic bottleneck. So in my early biology classes, I learned about elephant seals initially from a textbook as an example of what we call a genetic bottleneck. And that's because when we get the population down to very few animals, we don't have as much genetic diversity in the population left. And then we see the population come from these animals that are all relatively related to each other in terms of their genes. And that can affect their ability to deal with environmental fluctuation, for example, because a low genetic diversity makes it so that they're very good at what they do, but they might not be able to handle change very well. So far, elephant seals are doing great and they've totally bounced back from this, but it's still something to keep in mind as we start to see bigger and bigger changes in our environment. So from that little refuge, 
which is down here, Guadalupe Island. We have seen elephant seals expand in North or on our coast, essentially. And these are known elephant seal rookeries. And the star there is where I call home near Piedras Blancas, but the majority of elephant seal research has been done just north of Santa Cruz at Año Nuevo State Reserve. <laughs> that should have an Enye on the Año. <laughs> and, uh, and they've been studied there for decades now, since the mid 60s. And then that group at UC Santa Cruz, which initially it was Bernie LaBeouf and now Dan Costa's group, and it's been expanding from there. They also have been working down at San Benito Island in Mexico and studying the seals and looking at some remarkable similarities, which makes sense because of probably their genetic similarities, but also some of the differences that we might see in the animals at the southern end of their range. The largest populations collectively are in the Channel Islands, and they breed at San Miguel, Santa Rosa, and San Nicolas Island out in the Channel Islands, just south of, of San Luis Obispo here, just south of Santa Barbara, or off of Santa Barbara, I should say. And I think that they're capable of having these larger populations out there because there's less of a human influence, right? So often the islands, they can essentially do what they want, and when they, when they come along our shores, they're going to be coming into places where humans are potentially also trying to use the coast. But they're still expanding. And the most recently established rookery that we know of started at Vandenberg Air Force Base just a few years ago. So this year, we, we worked with the third instance of pupping at Vandenberg. So this is their third year now that they've been breeding at Vandenberg. They, they were showing up I think a year or two before they started breeding but there's just a small harem on a tiny beach there and they're they're turning out some pups now which is pretty exciting and it's interesting because what we'd like to know is whether this is overflow from the Channel Islands or overflow from Piedras Blancas maybe both and then where are these animals going from Vandenberg are they coming right back to Vandenberg because so far we've not seen any of our animals tagged at Vandenberg come back although they're young but where are they going when they leave here is a good question that we'd like to answer as well. So I mentioned, right, our elephant seals were bouncing back from near extinction. So I want to orient you to these next few graphs I'm going to show you. We've got year on the x-axis here, so we're just going over time. And then this is the number of births, so pups that were born in that year. And in general, when we estimate population, we, we look at the total number of animals being maybe four to five times the number of births that we see. And these data are from Lowry et al. 2014, which was a huge collaboration of the different elephant seal researchers so far, and precedes really me even coming in and studying elephant seals in a, in a substantial way. So you can see these trends of you get this exponential increase, and then it sort of plateaus off in the early to mid 90s here at San Miguel Island, and then a little bit later here at San Nicolas Island, and then it was still kind of increasing at Santa Rosa when they left off for this study. And then here in central Northern California, and I'm going to toggle back for just a second, watch that Y axis, you see how it's, uh, there are thousands more animals out on the Channel Islands than there are on our beaches, but, but I want you to pay special attention to the black symbols here. So these circles here are the animals at Año Nuevo. And I want to point out that research started at Año Nuevo in the mid-60s, so really early in terms of their recovery. And you can see that that did not negatively impact their recovery. They had that exponential growth, and then they eventually plateaued, just like we would expect to see with any normal population recovery. And they have been studied consistently in that entire time. And it's the reason we know so very much about elephant seals, because we've done that research. So the research that's being done, we're all really careful to try to not impact the populations. And I want to point out that one of the reasons we know so much about them is that we've been able to study them for so long and that it really isn't affecting their ability to be seals. One interesting thing you might note is here is about where 
you see it start to plateau here where the, we're no longer getting exponential growth and it's kind of staying the same. And that's also just around the time we started seeing seals at Piedras Blancas and Año Nuevo is a little bit north of us. So it's possible that we started getting this overflow from now there's no more room for seals at Año Nuevo and they started showing up here. And you can see that as far as we know, we are still in our exponential phase. There was this little dip right here, but we, we're still in this exponential phase of growth and we haven't seen it plateau. And we are at an estimated approximately 25,000 seals at Piedras Blancas at the moment. So we have surpassed the numbers at Año Nuevo and we're still growing for the time being. Again, these are births of pups, so this is not total number of seals. So I wanted to point out that this whole plateau thing that I keep talking about, the ecological term for this is carrying capacity. And it's defined as the maximum population size, so the maximum number of animals that the environment is able to maintain. So this can be a number of factors. This can relate to simply the amount of beach space that's available at that particular location. It can have to do with the predator pressure that might be around, how many sharks are out there waiting in the waters when these animals leave to go eat, and also how much food is out there for them. So what's interesting about the different elephant seal populations is a lot of them go to the same place to go eat but then they're gonna have a different amounts of beach space and potentially different predators hanging out and also different interactions with humans when they come back to haul out to breed and to molt. And so we see these different carrying capacities. I imagine that a lot of it has to do with space, but I also think that the human encroachment, which affects their space, can affect how many seals can be supported at a particular site. And so this is a graph that's similar to the ones that I showed you, but this is sort of an idealized graph of what we talk about with carrying capacity. And when we see a population recovering from really low numbers or establishing in a new place like they did here at Piedras Blancas, you see exponential growth originally, and it sort of goes up to a point where, uh-oh, right, now we're not able to sustain these animals, whether it be they've run out of space or there are too many predators or whatever's happening, and we see a decline, and then it comes back up, and it sort of fluctuates around some average number that that's, that's the plateau. And so when we average across this sort of fluctuation that we see here, that's what we define as carrying capacity for that population. And carrying capacity can change if something changes, right? If there's a new beach that becomes available, say when none of us are using the beaches and the seals show up and decide that it's, it belongs to them now, like happened up near San Francisco, or there might be a change in the environment. Maybe not enough food is going to sustain them anymore and we might see a decline in their population that will hit a new carrying capacity. But so ca carrying capacity isn't a factor of all of the different things that contribute to what can maintain a population. But in general, we see this time and time again with different populations. This is, like I said, just an idealized graph that we use in ecology to look at any sort of population growth. So back to the graph I showed you before, we're still in central and northern California here. And just a reminder that we started to see animals showing up at Piedras Blancas right around the time that Año Nuevo was hitting potentially carrying capacity. And that may, it, that may not be the only factor, but I find it really interesting. And it, it calls to mind, now we're starting to see them showing up at Vandenberg. And is that because they're running out of room in the Channel Islands or maybe even here at Piedras Blancas? So I have a graph here that's a little bit researcher biased in the sense of we think of the northern elephant seal calendar based on breeding season first. So I'm leading with breeding season, which is not the same as our calendar year. And I wanted to just talk about when we see seals on land versus when they're out at sea. So if we start in the breeding season, the adult males come in November and December to establish their territories. And the females come a little bit later after the males have kind of established where they like to be that year. And they give birth to a single pup. Twinning is very rare in pinnipeds. They typically have one pup per year. It's because that's all that they can sustain because the time that they are on the beach with their pup, they are fasting entirely. They don't eat or drink. And they, the moms are transferring their energy, really their blubber layer from themselves to their pup that entire time. And so we do see a lot of elephant seal moms who will adopt other seals, but unfortunately they usually don't have enough energy to get both of those pups to a big enough weaning weight that they can survive. So pups start being born in December and into January. 
and they nurse for about a month before mom is going to take off and go to her next foraging migration. And when mom starts to take off and get out, sorry, <laughs> when mom starts to take off and get out to the ocean is when the males will try to breed with them because they come into estrus right after they finished weaning their pups. So this is why it says breeding in January, February, sometimes beyond. Uh, or the males kind of hang out, I think, a little bit after breeding. So they're not really breeding when there are no females there, but they're hanging out a little bit before they finally head out to sea. Meanwhile, the pups who have nursed from mom for about a month stay on land for another two months, and they are sometimes three, <laughs> and they are finishing their physiological development. They're really just not quite ready to be seals yet. So they've gotten all this energy input from their mom in the form of her milk, and They've packed it on as a blubber layer, and now they are living off of that blubber layer while they finish their own development. Because elephant seals, as we'll talk about in a little bit, are super deep divers. And in order to get food, they're going to have to be able to hold their breath and stay underwater and be able to forage. And so they have to finish some of that development before they go out to sea. So they're hanging out on land, and they're, they're going to wait a little bit before they head out to sea. Notice that we didn't see any juveniles here during the breeding season. Juveniles are non-breeding animals, and it's really not safe for them to be hanging around in all the ruckus that goes along with the breeding behaviors that elephant seals have. And so you'll notice that they were there, and then just as the males come to establish their territories, they kind of leave. So they have a haul out, and it is ahead of the breeding season, probably so that the juveniles can avoid being in the mix of all the breeding behaviors. The beaches get really crowded. It can be dangerous. Males will run over anything in their way and juveniles don't want to be a part of that. And so they they go out to sea during the breeding season. And then right at the end of the breeding season, when it's safe to come out of the water again, they come out to molt. And it's around the same time that the adult females will come back from a short foraging migration and molt their fur. And I'll show you what that looks like in a few slides. The males tend to leave later and so they will they have a, a little bit longer foraging migration to replenish their energy stores and they come back to molt a little bit after the females. This line at the bottom here is what we're doing with the elephant seals in terms of our timing. So we start our population surveys during the juvenile haul out and we continue through into the breeding season and once we have weanlings we start weighing those weanlings as well and so we'll take that out as far as we can go. We tend to take a break in the summertime, partially because most of my research program is driven by undergraduates who aren't here, but also because there really just aren't that many seals on the beach except for our molting males at the time. And so we don't, we don't really make the effort for everyone to truck up to the rookery and count the few males that are hanging out to molt, although we may start a little earlier with our surveys in the coming year. So how do we know who is who when we're looking at the beach? So I wanted to share with you some of the ways that we classify these different animals. And this is how we train our, our research students and volunteers to help us with this. So pups are pretty distinctive. They're still hanging with their mom and they usually have black fur and have not yet molted that black fur. The black fur, the baby fur is called lanugo. That's the name for baby fur and pinnipeds. And they, if they're still with their mom, they're basically considered a pup. And then when we start to see them away from the females, they might still have their black fur or they, this guy right here has molted into a silvery coat like the first animal that I showed you when I was showing you characteristics of, pin, of true seals to begin with. So these are weanlings. They have weaned. They are not nursing for mom anymore. We affectionately call them weaners. And they tend to hang out together in these little weaner pods. And the snuggle is real, right? They, they hang out together. They've got to finish their development. And so they're going to they're gonna be in it together as kind of a group. So we also have some nicknames for these guys, right? When they still have their lanugo fur, they're called black coats. And then when they molt that fur into this nice silvery coat, we call them silver bullets. And then we also see animals that like to sneak milk from different moms and they, we call them super wieners. I also affectionately call this particular animal smush face for hopefully obvious reasons. It's kind of ridiculous. It's the Sharpay of elephant seals. 
All right, so other classifications of our animals. Yearlings are not that much bigger than pups. They, but we call them yearlings once they have left the beach for, their, for at least one feeding migration. So when they do come back to haul out after their very first feeding migration, they're considered a yearling or a juvenile. And until they've molted, here's a molted animal, they tend to have this yellowish kind of old looking coat. And they are longer than weanlings, but they're distinctively smaller than adults. And that's how we identify these guys compared to the other age classes. It gets a little harder. This one slide is where it's really difficult to distinguish, even for me sometimes, because adult females and the very early subadult males look very similar because they don't have the droopy nose. Adult females never really develop the nose that gives elephant seals their name. They do have a slightly daintier head structure compared to males, but that's sometimes really difficult to see, especially from a distance. And so it is difficult to distinguish what we call an SA1 or a subadult male one from an adult female. But if she has pups with her or a male is attempting to breed with her, although that's not always a distinguishing characteristic, um, it's probably an adult female. But these subadult males can kind of get away with hanging out and they look a lot like females until they get a bit older. So we call them subadult twos. When you start to see a distinctive nose droop that says, okay, for sure that's a male, but when they're lying down on the ground, their nose is not quite touching the sand. That's an SA2 for us. And when it starts to touch the sand, right, just enough, right, you could imagine if his chin is on the sand, then this little nose droop will also be on the sand. That's an SA3. And they start to have a little bit of the scarring that develops from the fighting that they do. They do start practicing fighting with each other at a pretty early age. And this, the big chest plates that you see are really just scar tissue from them biting at each other's necks. That's what that is. And it eventually creates this chest plate that does help to protect them a little bit from these fights that they do. But it isn't something that develops on the inside. It's something that develops from all the abuse that they're doing to each other on the outside. So we're not quite at adult male yet. We have SA4, subadult male four. And the way that we distinguish between an SA4 and an adult male is mostly from where the chest shield is, right? So this, this guy has, he's dry and, you, and he's not very pink here, but you see he has a big chest shield, but it doesn't quite go above his eye line. When the chest shield goes above the eye line, that's when we consider them officially an adult male. You'll also notice that they have this larger amount of scarring. It can be pink. Some of that is blood flow to, <laughs> as they're getting it, excited and their energy is going up, then they're going to start dissipating heat. But the big thing is that it, the chest shield starts to go above their eyes. You also tend to see, you know, longer and longer noses as these guys get older, but the SA4s will have a, uh, they will have a notch in their nose, but it gets even bigger in the adult males. So I mentioned that sexual dimorphism and you probably were like, why didn't you put the weights? I, I got it here for the elephant seals. But this is a, a great picture to show just the real difference between an adult male here, right? Here's that, that scarring above his eye line and an adult female and her pup who in this picture looks almost as big as she is. And the males get to about three times larger than the females, right? So the females get to up to maybe a ton <laughs> and the males can be a couple tons or even more, um, they're, they're big, big animals. And, and the difference in body size between the males and females is just, it's, it's incredible. And it's because these males are maintaining these territories, they get into these epic fights with each other over the females, and that is what wins them the ability to pass their, gen their genetic information on to the next generation. So I wanted to mention this cool thing, right? I, I showed you the sort of calendar of what's going on. And the reason that you can have this very reliable calendar for what's happening in elephant seals is because they have synchronous breeding. And this is very common in pinnipeds where they tend to give birth at 
pretty much the exact same time every year. And the time of year is different for different pinniped species, but the reason, the underlying reason is pretty similar. And it's because they have this cool thing called delayed implantation, also known as embryonic diapause, which means basically we're just pausing the development of the embryo. So they have an approximately nine month gestation period, right? So the time that they're developing this pup in utero is about nine months long, just like us. But what they do so that they can have the pup a year from when they were impregnated is they wait till the embryo gets to this stage called the blastocyst. So there has been a lot of cell division and there's sort of a mass of cells and then it's sort of hollow over here where the word blastocyst is written. And then it pauses and it does not implant and it waits. And this is directed by hormones and it is a physiological thing that different pinnipeds have. And so they pause the development of the pup for a couple of months and then they then then it unpauses and it develops for nine months like it should. And they're able to have their pup exactly a year after they were, imp or exactly a year later for breeding season. There is a month where they're, where they're nursing their pup before they become impregnated. So not quite a year after they became pregnant, but a year later in terms of the breeding season. And so this allows them to always have the pup at the same time, always come into estrus around the same time. And this allows these animals to go and forage out in the middle of the Pacific. And then they all know when to meet up again on land for breeding and it's all synchronized with one another. And I think, I think it's pretty amazing that that's a thing in not just these animals, but most pinniped species. But what makes our elephant seal so amazingly special? And I love this photo by Philip Kala. And here's that really deep notch. And it just cracks me up when these guys are calling and their nose just goes in their mouth. That's a thing for these guys. But why are they so special? Because they really are. One is that they have this really unique feature that we don't see in a lot of the other pinnipeds, which is called a catastrophic molt. So here's an animal in the middle of its molt, and you can see the silvery coat here that's coming in and the older coat that's just kind of being shed. But it's not being shed as little pieces of fur the way you would see with your cat or dog or even a lot of the other pinnipeds. What you see is that it comes off in these patches. And so they're molting pieces of skin along with their fur. And that is unusual. We're not 100% sure why they do it, but we know that they do it. So you can see these little, and sometimes you know, you'll see these little molted patches hanging out on the sand near them. But, it's, but they, they shed some of the layers of their epithelium, their skin, along with their fur. And that is unusual for mammals. It makes them kind of special and also contributes to the very distinct scent that elephant seals have. But another reason that these seals are really special is that they are the deepest diving pinnipeds. So southern elephant seals, which are the closest cousins to northern elephant seals and live in Antarctica, they are the deepest diving pinnipeds. But northern elephant seals are just right there with them, so they dive almost as deep. So I know this is in meters, but our northern elephant seals can get to about a mile below the surface of the ocean. That is incredibly deep if you were to think about it. It's a, it's a little more than three empire state buildings deep, if that helps you to orient. This is where they're going to get their food. And so I know they look silly on land, but these are amazing athletes that can hold their breath for a really long time. In fact, we think that elephant seals sleep underwater. So they really spend about 80% of their lives under the water and only about 20% above the water. And that's why they're more adapted to being underwater than they are to being above. And they have some just really incredible adaptations that allow them to stay under the water that long, to exercise while holding their breath, to get enough oxygen, to do the things they need to do to be a seal. And because of some of their incredible physiology, they've also been used as medical models for a few things, which I think is pretty incredible. One is that fasting that I mentioned to you. Every time they're on land, both for breeding and for molting their fur, they are completely fasting. They are not eating or drinking for two or three months. And there's a lot of physiology that underlies fasting. And we, we cannot go that long, right? We're three meals a day kind of mammals. And 
and there's a lot that changes in our bodies when we're fasting compared to when we're fed. And these animals have a big separation between when they're fed and when they're fasting. And there's a lot that they have to do to make sure that all of their organs still work correctly, even though they can't eat or drink for three months entirely. And yet they're not developing some of the pathology that we see going along with that, including something like insulin resistance, right? These animals are, when they are fasting, they're living entirely off their blubber layer, which is lipid. It's a lot of fat. And when humans are exposed to a high lipid diet, sometimes they can develop insulin resistance, right? And that that's the precursor for diabetes. And so we're studying elephant seals to, I say we, we is the scientific community, not me personally, but elephant seals are being studied, looking at why they don't develop insulin resistance with all of the the feeding and fasting that they do. And other hormone functions are important as well, including things like the urinary tract, right? If you don't eat or drink for months, how are they maintaining their water, their body water? And how are they doing that without messing up their kidneys, for example? So why am I interested, aside from the fact that elephant seals are fascinating, and specifically studying the seals at Piedras Blancas? Why would that be a good thing to do? I mentioned before, we are the largest mainland rookery for these animals. So the island rookeries have more seals, but Piedras Blancas, even though it's one of the more recently established places that elephant seals breed, has an estimated 25,000 seals now and still growing. And so it's really good to understand what is going on with this particular relatively new rookery where we're still in this exponential growth phase. And it's a relatively central location to the other rookeries, to the whole range of elephant seals where they breed. And so this is a potential hotspot for elephant seals moving from one rookery to another. And so it would be interesting to see if we can capture some of that movement by studying the seals that are at Piedras Blancas. And so far, we don't have a lot of data coming out of this rookery. I do want to give a shout out to Brian Hatfield, who recently retired from USGS. His day job was working with otters, but as a passion project, he single-handedly put flipper tags in elephant seal weanlings pretty much every year since I think one or two years after they first established at Piedras Blancas. And so he, he did contribute to that population study that I showed you before, the Laureate Owl paper, but we otherwise don't know very much about them in the scientific community, right? Lots of folks have been working with the seals here at Piedras Blancas, friends of the elephant seal, state parks, and also USGS, but we don't have it out there in the scientific world for comparison to the other rookeries. And I think that's an important thing to do because as I mentioned, we're right in the middle here. And also it gives us a chance to understand now that we are over a century out from when these animals were first hunted to near extinction, you know, do we start to see differences because maybe they've started to develop some genetic diversity at these different populations or not? Either way is interesting because if it's true that we can study one population of elephant seals and know something about all the elephant seals, that's really good to know because it means that we can just do a study focused in one place and know all that we need to know about that particular aspect. Or if we see differences at these different populations, then we want to understand why we might see those differences. And so it would be important to study them at different sites like Piedras Blancas so we can compare and understand what is contributing to maybe some new differences we see among populations that we might not have seen before. So I get to talk about this because I'm, I'm normally, I am in charge, <laughs> but I do have amazing students who contribute to this and the folks pictured here, the, the first three are graduate students of mine at Cal Poly. Melissa and Emma have graduated, and Cameron is about to defend her thesis on elephant seal whiskers very soon. And Gabriel is a current undergraduate who has been helping take the lead as my graduate students have been graduating. But this has been 26 undergraduate volunteers strong over the past three years that we've been studying the elephant seals. So we started in the 2018 breeding season, which means fall of 2017, looking at Piedras Blancas in a more formal way. And it's all about the students. These guys are the ones that really drive the whole thing because I can be out there as much as my one self can be out there, but these guys are really out there repeatedly and getting the data that we need to understand these animals. 
So I'm going to give you a little bit about what we're thinking about in terms of what we want to know about these animals. There's always more to ask, but we're starting sort of at ground level here. And so we want to start just getting some baseline information about the population demographics. And what I mean by that is who is on the beach when, how many of the different age classes do we see at the different times of year? And just in general, how many males versus females versus sub-adult males, et cetera. And we're hoping that by adding to the flipper tagging, which I'll show you what that looks like in a moment, we're going to be able to contribute to understanding movements among the different breeding sites. As I mentioned, we're kind of at a hub here where we're in the middle. We're near the Channel Islands. We're also near Año Nuevo. They've just started up at Vandenberg. And we'd like to see who's moving where because we do see different colored tags, which indicate that they were born at different rookeries, showing up in different places. And that's how we can find out where they're going. One of the things we've just started doing, and I'll show you some preliminary data for this, is looking at harem structure, which hasn't been studied in northern elephant seals. There's been a little bit on southern elephant seals, and there's a lot that influences how their harems change. Some of it has to do with the topography of the beach, meaning how the beach is structured and what is the substrate. Is it rocky? Is it sandy? We don't have as much difference in the substrate. Most of our beaches here where they haul out are sandy, but we're trying to see if there are differences in harem structures among the beaches at Piedras Blancas and what factors might be driving those differences. And then I'd mentioned before that one of our big things that we're doing, which is similar to what they do at Año Nuevo, is we are weighing and measuring our weanlings. Oh my goodness, I just can't, am going and it's almost noon, I just noticed. So I'll try to get through some of these methods with you guys so we can get to questions. Okay, so how do we do these things? So we mark the animals with hair dye. This is not a brand, I promise. We use hair dye on a big stick and I'll show you a picture of it. And that helps us to track the animals throughout the breeding season and follow where they're going. And also when we do this on our pups, we're able to tell what date they've weaned because we can follow the same animal and say, I saw 6J with mom two days ago and now it's a weanling. Then we recite our animals, both from marks and also from these flipper tags that you see here, which have a unique color and a number. And that allows us to, in cooperation with other elephant seal researchers, figure out what animal we're looking at. And then I mentioned that we're counting harems, which I'll show you something about, hopefully. And then as, and then as I said, we are weighing some of the weanlings, and that's a little picture of a, kind of what that looks like. So this is a picture of someone marking a, an elephant seal pup. And this is not a video, but I, it'll kind of animate <laughs> that you can see that what we get is a little head turn. And then we walk away. So this was hair dye that was written in backwards mirror writing on this little piece of wood that's on a dowel that allows us to be a safe distance away from the animal and to minimize disturbance. You see we got some head raises which really aren't even considered disturbance according to NOAA and then we're able to walk away and we only do this when we have access to animals that are on the periphery of a group and it's safe to do so but that allows us to track them from far away so we don't have to disturb them and try to look at those tiny flipper tags in their flippers. So here's an example on a subadult male and on another weanling. They're easy to see from far away and we can match them to their flipper tags if we mark an animal that already has a tag, which is really cool because then we can follow a known animal. And our docents from state parks and also friends of the elephant seal are able to help us recite these animals on days or at times that we're not there and contribute to our database. And it helps us to understand animal movement within the rookery, but also between. And the reason this animal here is marked with PBK1 is because the PB stands for Piedras Blancas because sometimes our boys end up at Año Nuevo and they wanna know that it was our animal marked and not one of theirs. This is what it looks like to put in the flipper tags. It's kind of like how they do the ear piercing at the mall. It's a quick little snip, not snip, but clip. And then we walk away and we have a unique number and color. And this, these are the different colors that we use that distinguish the different rookeries here. So green is on your Nuevo. Uh, Point Reyes and the Farallons share the pink color. We are white, Piedras Blancas. I think that was on purpose. And we have some down in Cape San Martin and Gorda that are purple, San Nicolas is red, San Miguel is yellow, and all of the rescue organizations, including the Marine Mammal Center, use orange, which is why I pointed out on that sea lion 
video earlier when we saw the sea lions with orange slipper tags, that means that they'd been through rehab. And we just started tagging at Vandenberg Air Force Base and the only color left was blue. So that's what we use to tag our critters at Vandenberg. Okay, really quickly, when we look at the harem data, I want you to understand what we mean. We, we were classifying the harems basically as we see an adult male that is guarding females and we count the number of females in the harem, but it's considered a central harem when there's a harem within 10 meters on either side of it. Those are peripheral harems if there isn't another one on the other side of that and isolated harems don't have another harem around them. This is a little bit what wiener weighing looks like. We sex the animal and measure its weight by suspending it from this tripod. There's a scale behind the folks there. And we also measure the, the length of the animals and the axillary girth, which is under the armpits. And then we put two flipper tags in our weanlings that we weigh so that we know that that was a weighed animal if we recite it with two flipper tags. Everyone else gets a single flipper tag. And I want to point out that this is, it, it seems like a lot, but it's minimally invasive. And from start to finish, from us capturing an animal, weighing it and measuring it and putting in those flipper tags, it's about five minutes. So this is just the number of animals that we've managed to work with over the past three years. We had some folks that had to, including myself actually, they couldn't do as much this year due to injury. And so we did not get to mark or weigh as many animals as we had hoped, but we're hoping to increase our efforts in future years. And we did start tagging all of the pups that we could access born at Vandenberg in the 2019 breeding season. And we've seen it a little higher. That's only supposed to be one F this year. And so it's potentially growing, although it's a small beach and just a single harem of animals. Okay, a few graphs and we're going to be done. Here's our preliminary data for what we see with harem structure. And what we see is central harems tend to be bigger. Peripheral harems are in between. We were wondering whether being the northern part or the southern part of the beach would matter, and it does not. And then the isolated harems tend to be smaller. I do have a student doing a senior project this year that we'll be looking at if there are other factors like the tide height, the size of the beach, other things like that, environmental things, as well as just how densely packed the animals are that contribute to the size of the harems. So with weanling weights, we found that males tend to be bigger than females. And you might not be surprised by that, but we were because they don't see sexual dimorphism in weanlings at Año Nuevo, which is the one place where this has been going on for many years. They don't see a significant difference in male and female weaning weights, but we have over the past two years. Now it's a relatively small difference, only about five to 8% depending on the year. But it is, it is statistically significant, which is very interesting because it's, it seems like we're seeing the sexual dimorphism or perhaps a difference in maternal investment earlier in our population than they're seeing at Año Nuevo. We also took a look at differences between our two main weighing beaches, which are called Arroyo Laguna and La Tortuga. And one of the things that we noticed is we tend to see higher weaning rates, weights at La Tortuga than at Arroyo Laguna. There is a little bit less human disturbance at La Tortuga because it's further away from the highway and it's harder for people to access. But what's interesting is if you separate it out by sex, it seems like the difference is driven by the female weanling weights and not as much by the males. So we're going to look into that a little bit more, but I thought that was super interesting. And we're really interested to see if this difference holds over the different years. So we're going to keep trying to work on this and expand our efforts here, including how many of the beaches that we regularly survey and work with the animals and doing things like this, sharing what we're finding out with the public, involving our friends of the elephant seal friends who are really excited to help us with reciting animals. And we're in cooperation with the computer science department at Cal Poly, we are developing our own database that the citizen scientists will be able to upload their recite data into and contribute to our growing data set that we're trying to do. And one of the things we're interested in doing is potentially increasing the efficacy and the accuracy of our surveys using some sort of unmanned aerial vehicle, which we're hoping to test in the coming years. So 
why would we want to do this? I mentioned this briefly and I want to get to questions. I know some of you may have to go, but we want to understand how the animals are using our beaches and when they're here because that helps us to better manage coastal access for humans in a way that is safe for both the humans and the seals. And one of the things you may have been wondering when I talked to you about those age classifications, well, how old are they when they're an SA2 or an SA3? And the answer is we don't actually totally know the answer yet. And that's one of the things that we want to do. So we're using the same classifications that Anya Nuevo uses, but if we tag enough animals, we will know their age because we tag them the year that they're born and we can start to validate, well, I call that an SA2, which animal is this? And we'll know how old it is. We're interested in looking at breeding dynamics, where they're going between rookeries, and we're really hoping to help state parks to plan for protection of the lands that they manage with these seals on them, again, for both the safety of the seals and for people so that everyone can share the beach that these amazing animals are using. And so I do want to acknowledge my collaborators at UC Santa Cruz, also my collaborators at the Friends of the Elephant Seal, and Brian Hatfield, who really got started with this population before I ever even made it out here to San Luis Obispo. All the permitting that allows us to do the work that we're able to do. And these are the students who really drive the research program and I couldn't do it without them. They're amazing. And I wanna thank you for listening and hope that you're able to get some of your questions answered.